thanks for joining us here today. Um, my name is Steve Spatz, for those who I don't know. Um, I am an account manager and consultant here with Efficiency Vermont. And today we are co-hosting a training with Chris Smith from Zender America on uh, basics and introduction to residential ventilation. Um, this is a part of our regular series with the EEN of, of uh, engaging with uh, different manufacturers and different uh, product categories and uh, in the construction industry to, uh, to talk about building science, equipment options, um, and talk a little bit about uh, their products and options in the marketplace as well. So Chris is with us today from Zender. He's their business development manager. Um, Chris has been uh, over 15 years in the residential design build industry, um, both as a designer and a construction supervisor. And uh, he is a NHB passive, NHHB certified green professional and a certified passive house tradesperson. Uh, Chris has been in the center for quite a while now. Many of you, you guys may have, have worked with, with Chris in the past, probably seen him at BBD. Um, Chris is very hands-on working with contractors and optimizing ventilation systems and, and helping with the details of getting them installed. So just the right person to be talking about the subject here today. So. Chris is going to go through the content for us. Um, we'll have um, some breaks, three or four stops throughout the content where um, Chris can answer some questions. So if you have questions as this is going along, um, just drop the question into the chat and or raise your hand. And then when uh, Chris is, is ready to stop, we'll, we'll take a break then and address those questions. So um, we are recording this, just so you're aware. Um, and we will post it on our uh, website, our trainings and events section um, after we're done here today. So Chris, thanks for doing this. Appreciate you being here and take it away. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, and thanks to, I can't see you, but whoever, whoever did uh, join on, uh, thanks for being here today. We do have a lot of content um, and this is actually uh, out of what we're putting together as a Zender Academy for North America. There's about four or five sessions that we're pulling together just to form this one presentation today. So uh, I am gonna try to scream through it pretty good. Uh, I think some of this for some of you might be some uh, uh, review, um, but it is introductory in nature. Uh, there'll be, we'll follow up uh, later in the month with, with something um, we can sink our teeth into a little bit more, but uh, we do have, uh, boy, about a hundred slides here. So I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get cranking. And uh, as Steve said, we'll pause for some questions as we go along. Um, so first, I'm just gonna do an introduction, uh, ventilation, why and what. Um, so the word ventilation, uh, probably to, to uh, you know, experienced tradespeople is pretty familiar, but to some people, the word ventilation could mean anything where there's air blowing. They don't know where the air is coming from necessarily or what the purpose of the blowing air is, whether it's for comfort or whether it's for heating or cooling or anything, um, ventilation is just sort of air moving around to them. Um, but we wanna get a little bit more specific about that. Um, ventilation specifically is geared towards addressing indoor air quality or maintaining good indoor air quality. Um, there are a number of different kinds of indoor air quality contaminants that, um, are very common in all houses and they range from uh, PM, which is particulate matter, uh, not dust that you can see, but even smaller stuff that you can't see. Uh, there's VOCs, these are um, off-gassing uh, compounds. Uh, we've got microorganisms potentially, or we do actually in, in all houses that's mold and um, dust mites, things like that. Uh, CO2, which is a product of respiration, it's what we give off as we breathe, moisture, odors. So a lot of different kinds of things that make up for uh, air quality issues. And one solution, uh, such as filtration, common, common thought that people have is if you got air quality problems, then throw a filter in. But filters can't deal with everything. And so that's where we turn to ventilation. Ventilation is actually pretty effective at dealing with just about all of these air quality issues. Um, so it effectively delete, dilutes VOC levels. Uh, it effectively dilutes particulate levels. 
It effectively reduces indoor humidity levels um, depending on the climate and where you're at, but in, in many climates, it's a good way for controlling humidity. Um, it effectively dilutes CO2 levels, uh, but there's one major disadvantage of, of uh, ventilation as an air quality um, solution, and that is that if you just change outdoor air with indoor air, you're giving up some energy that's been spent to condition the indoor air. Um, but aside from that disadvantage, ventilation has been shown to be a, a very highly effective indoor air quality tool. So that's the why. We'll talk about the what. What exactly is ventilation? When we talk about ventilation in buildings, we want to kind of look at it in terms of dilution. So dilution is, is when you make something weaker. Um, uh, you think of a solution, uh, something maybe in a beaker or a glass. You might pour yourself a cocktail or you might be working in a science lab and you have a solution. You've got a solvent, which is your main fluid, and then you're, you've got solutes that are inside that fluid. And the concentration of the solute tells you what your, your concentration of your solution is. Um, in this case, I've put an example up. If you've got a 20% solution, 20% solutes in, in, the, uh, in the solution, then by adding solvent, you can dilute that solution. Um, too much rum in your Coke, just add Coke. Now you have a, a lower solution of rum in your Coke. Um, if we apply this to houses, which we can, because a house is a container and it's filled with fluid. The fluid isn't a liquid, but the fluid is a gas typically. Um, and so, uh, but it's still a solution. Uh, we have air, uh, which is, you know, mostly nitrogen with some other things in there, carbon dioxide, oxygen, of course. Um, but that air is a, is a compound that's holding a bunch of contaminants in solution. Um, and so if we have a lot of contaminants, if we have a, a high percentage solution in our house, then we can dilute that by adding more solvent. And in this case, the solvent is air, um, outdoor air. This works because as we've probably all heard, the EPA says that indoor air can actually be up to five times more polluted than outdoor air. Um, that's not the case if you're in Northern California during fire season, um, but most of the time, even in urban settings, uh, that is still true that the outdoor air is usually cleaner than the indoor air. And so by adding outdoor air, we're able to, um, to dilute the concentration of, of contaminants. Um, when we do this in a house, we're not simply adding air. We're not simply, um, you know, we're, the house isn't like a balloon. You can just pump more air in and it expands. No, ventilation is when outdoor air comes in and then that, that uh, some measure of that concentrated solution goes out. So there's air coming in and air going out. And in essence, you have an exchange going on. Um, and so as we've shown here, we bring in uh, relatively clean outdoor air into a relatively contaminated building. And what leaves the building is contam contaminated air. We do this over the course of time, continue to bring in clean air over the course of time, the concentration of contaminants in the air inside the house will be reduced. So I think that that's uh, pretty much common sense, but just to define in, in some specific terms here what we're talking about. We're talking about air exchange with the goal of diluting the contaminants inside the building. Uh, let's talk about some common ventilation rate terminology. So the, the ventilation rate or the flow rate is basically describing what volume of air is being exchanged in a given amount of time. And there's two very typical ways that this is talked about. One's talked about in a very absolute way, and that is um, usually in North America in CFM or cubic feet per minute. And so that's a very absolute measure. So many, you know, so let's just say 10 cubic feet per minute. That's defined right there. That's how much air is being exchanged. A more relative way of talking about air exchange is to talk about ACH. And ACH is air changes per hour 
This, of course, is relative to the size or the, of the room or the size of the building, depending on what we're talking about. Um, we'll see some examples as we go on later how this is used. But um, in ACH, of course, it's more relative because the room or the building size might vary. But once we've established what size that room or that building is, and then we say we're doing so many air changes per hour, now we've found a way to measure the air exchange or the ventilation rate. Um, we've been talking about dilution a bit, and uh, there's, a, there's a saying, very common saying that gets uh, thrown around in a couple different ways. Um, it's, been, it's been said in the past that dilution, and I'm sorry if I don't give the proper credit to whoever's made this up. I've read different things, so I'm not sure who to credit. But um, the, the rhyme is dilution is the solution to indoor pollution. In other words, um, if you've got indoor pollution, just pump in more air and uh, you, the, the, the contaminated air will leave the building and that's the solution. And then other people will come and say, well, no, that's really not the solution. The solution is to control the pollutants to begin with. You know, so let's build cleaner. Let's not, let's not, uh, let's not bring in so many materials that, that give off pollution. Um, and so they say dilution is not the solution to indoor pollution. Um, and what I want to say today, that the, the, the impression I want to leave you with um, is that of if you've had the experience, I've, I've had six kids, and so I've had plenty of experiences changing diapers. And um, if, if you're in the bathroom changing a diaper and you go to throw the diaper in the bucket, I mean, you, you do two things. You turn on that bathroom exhaust fan to get rid of the stink. And then as soon as you can, you wrap up that diaper and you get rid of the diaper too. So it's both source control and ventilation or dilution. That's the way that we maintain comfort. Um, so, uh, so by talking about ventilation, we're not saying you shouldn't build well. Um, we're saying, yeah, build well, but even then you still are going to need to introduce some ventilation. Let me show you this example. This is from a 2016 study done by Hayward Healthy Homes. This is a, a California outfit. Uh, some of you have maybe met Carl Grimes from uh, Hayward Score. But anyway, he did this study on this house. They built this house um, very purposefully with low VOC materials, uh, they, you know, trying to, trying to minimize anything that would produce indoor pollution. And the problem is, is that especially with building materials, VOCs are so ubiquitous that it's hard to get away from them in everything. You can pick certain materials where you've got good controls, but overall, um, there's still an awful lot of off-gassing. And again, VOCs are only one category of contam contaminant, but, um, but they're an important one. Um, here, what you can see is that um, this house was ventilated at what I would say is a pretty um, enhanced rate of 0 0.6 air changes per hour. And they kept the VOCs at a pretty low count. Um, they turned off the ventilation system and continued to monitor the VOCs. And just because of off-gassing, not because new materials were brought into the house, but just because the materials that were part of the construction were off-gassing actively, that that uh, VOC count skyrocketed um, over the course of, I think it was a day or so. Then they, they turned the system back on and it ran at a more of a nominal rate, uh, sort of you know normal rate of 0 0.3 ACH. And they were able to, uh, to, to drop that rate quite a bit. Um, somewhere in the middle of the screen there, you can see that, that somebody opened the door and, and came into the building and so the VOCs dropped down pretty quickly, but then built up again. And then they went back to their enhanced rate of 0 0.6 ACH and, and really got the VOCs back under control. So this is in a house where people tried really hard and still we've got a lot of VOC off-gassing. So we wanna do both source control and dilution through ventilation systems. Um, we've got some knowledge checks here, which we're gonna skip past and, uh, and just give you an opportunity instead to ask some questions. So Steve, I don't know if you want to uh, see if there's anybody there that's got a, got a question at this point. Again, this is very introductory. Any questions, guys? 
and uh, just feel free to raise your hand and I'll call on you. So give it a moment here, otherwise we'll keep rolling. Okay. All right, we're good to go. All right, we'll stop again in a bit. Um, so we're gonna get into the learning objective. That, that was all introductory. We're gonna get into some learning objectives here for the presentation today. One is to recognize the impact and effectiveness of infiltration and natural ventilation. Then we'll move, move on from there and compare and contrast the basic methods of mechanical ventilation. Um, we'll look at common codes and standards for ventilation, point three. And then learning objective four is we'll look at some of the advantages of advanced ventilation features like energy recovery and dedicated distribution systems. So first of all, uh, let's recognize the impact and effectiveness of infiltration and natural ventilation. So what is natural ventilation? Natural ventilation is air that's exchanged without the use of any fans or blowers. Um, and natural ventilation is driven by pressure differences between the outside and inside of the building. And these pressure differences are usually due to either wind or to stack effect. Um, wind pressure, uh, I've got three paragraphs here, which seems ridiculous. The wind blows, if the windows are open, air comes in and goes out the other side. So that's how you get that ventilation. Uh, stack effect is, is maybe not as well understood, although by building professionals probably is. Uh, but stack effect refers to changes in pressure inside the building that are due to temperature differences within the building itself. So of course, warmer air is more buoyant than cooler air. And so that warmer air rises um, up to the upper levels of a building, the same way that, that smoke rises up a smokestack or, or um, whatever vapors are in there. Um, so the warm air rises to the upper part of the building. As it does, it creates pressure in the upper part of the building and it escapes through the openings in the upper part of the building. And as that happens, a vacuum is being created in the lower part of the building. And so the outdoor air is being pulled in. And so now this isn't necessarily due to wind, uh, although wind could be in co combination with this, but just through this natural stack effect, um, you're pulling in outdoor air into the building. And in a sense, uh, you're, you're, you're accomplishing ventilation. You're, you're doing air exchange and diluting the contaminants inside the building by doing that. Um, now, with all of these things, the possibility that you are at the same time introducing new contaminants is always possible. So this isn't necessarily an indoor air quality uh, solution or an advisable one, but it is um, just reality that happens in buildings. And so we want to acknowledge it, that it's going on. Um, so natural ventilation by design, uh, you can place windows, clear stories or vents strategically in a building to take adv advantage of things like wind and stack effect. Um, this was common uh, in past centuries, of course, when before they had mechanical uh, ventilation. Um, and so this but, but even now today, you know, if you travel to the Caribbean or other moderate climates, you'll see that uh, natural ventilation and is designed into buildings pretty effectively. Um, not so much in more extreme climates because it's not as practical for comfort. So that's uh, natural ventilation uh, being used on purpose with windows or vents. Um, we want to talk as well about infiltration and exfiltration. Um, here, I don't know if you can see the details of this, but basically it's just a cross section of a typical house with typical construction features. Um, and it's showing all the places that air leaks into a house from outside and also where air from inside the house leaks out to the outside. Um, so you've got things like uh, air creeping in around the sill plate around penetrations for vents or faucets or pipes, um, air that can penetrate, leak in through uh, inactive exhaust vents um, around construction details like 
top plates, things like that. And then uh, air escaping, that's typically, especially in a climate like ours up here in the Northeast, um, air is very often escaping uh, in the upper part of the building uh, through um, openings in the ceilings for, for lights or other vents or whatever, air is escaping into the attic, things like that. So just acknowledging that, that um, you know, even a pretty good building without being extremely purposeful is going to be leaky. You're going to have infiltration or exfiltration. Infiltration is air leaking in, exfiltration is air leaking out. Um, these can be compounded by or, or driven by wind pressure and stack effect, of course. And um, in some ventilation codes, this natural or, or typically occurring uh, infiltration is accounted for. So uh, you can actually use it to, to be part of your, the ventilation in the building. Um, but what's happening increasingly is rather than using in leakiness to ventilate the building, codes are working more and more steadily towards the end of eliminating leakiness as best as possible and then doing more deliberate mechanical ventilation. Um, in any case, the codes that do allow for, for leakiness to count towards the ventilation are going to require you to quantify that leakiness. Um, that's done via a blower door test. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with this, but um, the idea is you seal up a house, uh, you, 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 you put this blower door uh, device over the front door opening or any door opening on the exterior wall, and then you pressurize or depressurize the house, or you actually run the test in both modes. And then you measure um, how much pressure it takes or how much leakage you get at a certain pressure. And uh, that, that allows you to quantify the leaky, leakiness of the building. And then you can in turn uh, try to predict with, with some reasonable guesstimate um, how much ventilation you might get through infiltration or exfiltration. So there's limitations on natural ventilation. Um, it can be a contributing factor in indoor air quality, but it's just typically not a reliable approach. It's not comfortable year round in most climates. It's difficult to control consistently. Uh, you know, you gotta rely on the wind or your heating system or something. Um, energy codes are going, trending in the opposite direction of requiring increasing air tightness. And of course, uncontrolled air movement in and out of the building carries energy with it. So that's not necessarily helpful. Um, again, we'll blow past the knowledge checks. Any questions then on, on um, natural ventilation, infiltration, exfiltration? If anybody's got any questions, go ahead and uh, raise your hand. All right, keep rolling, Chris. All right. Hi, Bill. You can see Bill joined us as well now too. So we got Bill, Alex, Michael, and Rob on the call here, Chris. Great. Thanks, guys. Hi, Bill. Um, yeah, so learning objective two, we're gonna compare and contrast the basic, basic methods of mechanical ventilation. Um, these should be pretty familiar. Uh, so obviously, as we just said, natural ventilation has, has quite a number of limitations. And so fans and blowers have been adapted uh, in different ways to be able to control the airflow in and out of buildings and to accomplish ventilation. There's three basic types of mechanical ventilation. There's a lot of variations on these, uh, call them variations on a theme, but let's say there's three basic themes. One is exhaust only, or at least, you know, exhaust on purpose. Uh, the other would be supply only or supply on purpose. And then um, balanced, where, you, where you're focusing on, on using fans or blowers for both supply and the exhaust. So we'll look at each of these briefly. Exhaust only ventilation. Um, exhaust only ventilation uses a fan or multiple fans, and it uses them only in exhaust mode. So they're simply pulling air out of the house and delivering it to the outdoors. Um, so those, those are the only fans. The fans are depressurizing the house. Typically when you're doing exhaust ventilation only, 
Uh, these fans are located in the kitchen for the vent hood and in the bathrooms, uh, the bathroom exhaust fans. There's no fan that is uh, supplying fresh outdoor air to the house. So you're, that's why we call it exhaust only. You're only running exhaust fans and you're depressurizing the house and therefore you are uh, sucking outdoor air in through uh, usually um, it's infiltration. Usually it's leaks in the building envelope. This sketch here uh, shows the, the possibility that there's some deliberate inlets uh, located in a wall or some aspect of the building. Um, and that's where the fresh air would come in. Um, but that is, uh, I, I've never seen that. Uh, so I, I, I'm not familiar with it. I doubt that that is very, very often done. Um, typically, if you're doing exhaust only ventilation, you're relying on the supply air to come from outside through leaks in the building. Um, what are the disadvantages of this? Well, of course, you're exhausting out conditioned air for most of the year. So your, whatever energy was spent on conditioning that air is going out the stack and, and, and contributing to the, uh, the, the, not the local microclimate. Um, of course, you've got to spend more energy now to condition that infiltrated air because that didn't get conditioned on its way in either. Um, infiltrated air can pick up pollutants depending on where it's come, coming from. So again, if you had some very deliberate inlets and you had a filter on there, that might be a good idea. Um, but typically that's not done. So again, the, the outdoor air is coming in around uh, leaks in the sill in the basement or around basement windows or around pipes or whatever. And it's not coming through the most uh, clean parts of the building. Um, you're negatively pressurizing the space. This could uh, potentially draw radon into the house. Um, it could potentially um, draw flue gases. If you've got an atmospheric uh, combustion appliance, you could be drawing flue gases back down through the, uh, through the chimney. Um, so anyway, and then in, if you're in a humid climate, um, doing exhaust ventilation where you've air conditioned the interior space, Again, you're, you're gonna pull humid air in through leaks in the building and that humid air is gonna find cool surfaces on the back of drywall or something where it's gonna condense and eventually form mold. So that's uh, uh, exhaust only ventilation. It, it, it's very common, especially here in the Northeast, um, but it's, it's, it's got plenty of disadvantages. Supply only ventilation, not as common. Um, I actually don't recall seeing this anywhere, but apparently it exists. That's where outdoor air is, uh, is, is pulled in from outdoors using the fans and is delivered directly uh, to the indoor space. And so you're not using exhaust fans to pull air out, you're using supply fans to push air in. And, um, and then again, you're relying on random leaks in the building now for exfiltration, and that's where your stale air would be pushed out of the building. So disadvantages, uh, again, would be that uh, you're driving conditioned air out of the building. So giving up the energy spent on, on heating or cooling. Um, you also have to, uh, you've got to now condition the additional outdoor air that you've delivered through this supply air. And then in a cold climate, um, you'd be, you'd be sort of pushing relatively humid air through the building assembly until it hits cold sheathing typically somewhere in the wall assembly where it's gonna condense, but it's gonna be condensing back behind uh, your insulation and stuff. So again, potential for mold and things like that. Um, and then you've got balanced ventilation. And uh, balanced ventilation is a, is, a, is a pretty good combination of supply and exhaust. Um, you have both supply and exhaust fan or fans working together, and this has several advantages. Uh, because you're controlling the pressure, you're not depressurizing or pressurizing the house with fans, um, you're not driving infiltration or exfiltration. Now, it doesn't mean that infiltration and exfiltration won't happen because of things like wind pressure or stack effect, 
but at least uh, at the rate that you're driving mechanical ventilation with fans, you're not driving that much leakage. So um, the outdoor air can, can bring in less pollution. It can be filtered. Uh, you're not relying on, on, on random leaks. Um, and you can combine these supply and exhaust fans into a single appliance. And then with that appliance, if you want, you can, you can add heater energy recovery to get even more um, economy out of that process, out of the ventilation process. So that was pretty quick. Um, any questions on mechanical, uh, the, the basic forms of mechanical ventilation? Any questions? Anybody raise hands? Keep rolling. Looking good. Okay. And as I expect, most of this is probably uh, review, as I said before. So running objective number three, let's be familiar with the common codes and standards for mechanical ventilation. Uh, here's where we'll probably spend some more time. So we're gonna look at, um, we're gonna look at a few different codes. What I wanna do before we get into the codes themselves is I wanna just sort of almost, uh, I guess, philosophically break down, again, what is it that we're trying to accomplish with ventilation and uh, you know, what aspects of that feed into the codes. And we're gonna find that there's some common features. The codes may vary, but there's common features um, that get addressed in the codes. And those common features get addressed in very similar ways um, across the board. So uh, there's three key factors involved in codes. Um, and we didn't, there's an a introductory session on IAQ that sort of, um, that I give that talks more about this stuff and we would have covered that, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of cover it right now. Basically any, any ventilation standard or the ventilation codes that you're gonna commonly co come across are designed to specify the right amount of ventilation to dilute um, the indoor pollutants inside the building. And the codes basically are addressing three areas of um, pollution or, or contamination. One is the building in general. So um, we're showing the house in the green circle. That's, that's one thing we want to target is the building itself. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, because the building itself, as we, as we saw earlier when I showed you the, the Hayward Healthy Homes example, um, even a good building itself is partly a source of indoor air quality contaminants. So a building is of a certain size and based on its size, it's gonna have a certain amount of materials in it. Um, and so it's going to, it's going to contribute in, in, in a proportional manner to the indoor air quality issues in that, in that, inside that building. Also, um, the building envelope is what's defining this space, uh, this container with fluid inside of it. And so because that building envelope is of a certain size, um, then we have a certain amount of fluid in solution that's being held there. And so the building size also sort of defines the size of the problem in general. Um, so for those reasons, uh, we're gonna see in, in codes, all codes and standards, that there's some attention given to the size of the building. Then, a second feature that's going to be common in all standards is going to be looking at the number of occupants inside that building. Um, the recognition there is, again, twofold. First of all, that the occupants themselves are another source of indoor contaminants. I know you guys shower regularly and wear your deodorant, but the fact is, is that we're biological beings and we are off-gassing all the time, um, even when we try not to. So again, we have a respiratory system. We are constantly breathing. We're, we're constantly giving off H2O and CO2, among other things. Um, we're giving off bioeffluence. So we're, we're stinkifying the inside of buildings. Um, there's a number of reasons why people themselves are 
are a source of indoor air quality contaminants. And so for that reason as well, part of the code of standard for any building on ventilation is gonna look at the number of occupants in the building. And then of course, um, the air quality doesn't matter for the building mostly, it mostly matters for the occupants. And so that's the other reason, of course, we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to help people. So we wanna, we wanna quantify the rate of ventilation that's gonna be helpful for people as well. Third, besides the size of the building and besides the number of people, the third thing that any code and standard is gonna look at is gonna, is gonna be making sure that we have local exhaust in places where there are concentrated pollutants. And these are usually bathrooms and kitchens. Um, could be some minor variations on that, you know, place like a, like a laundry room or something like that. But basically you're looking at local exhaust in bathrooms and kitchens. And so um, these three are, are gonna be folded into all the codes we're gonna, and we're gonna see how they are. Um, ventilation for the building, we talked about this. Ventilation for the occupants, we talked about this. We talked about ventilation for concentrated pollutants. So these, three things are gonna be factored together in coming up with a ventilation rate for a building. Um, and pretty much what happens a lot of times, regardless of the way that the code or the standard is written, usually what will happen is that when you provide all of the local exhaust that code requires you to for the number of bathrooms and kitchens or maybe a laundry room, whatever the code is, is addressing, for local exhaust. By the time you do that local exhaust and total up the number of CFM, usually what you're gonna find is that um, you're gonna, with that local exhaust, you're gonna also meet the, uh, the ventilation requirement for the building size and for the occupants. Now, I'm not saying that you always will, but what I'm saying is most of the time you'll find that that is the case. So, um, just because there's these three points, it doesn't mean that all three have to add up. Typically, the, the ventilation rate for the occupants, once that's calculated, does have to be added with the ventilation rate for the size of the building once that's calculated. We're going to get into this. I'll show you the examples. But these two do have to be added together. But usually, the, the local exhaust can be on the other side of the equation. And so um, if you meet all of that with the local exhaust, then... Uh, then usually you don't have to do more than that. So we'll see this in examples. Um, so three, three codes that we're gonna look at and then I'll make some comments about the Vermont code. Um, we'll look at the ASHRAE standard 62.2. We'll look at the international mechanical code and then we'll, we'll look briefly at the passive house standard as well. And in today's presentation, we're just summarizing each of these, okay? The, so if, you know, it's important that you be more familiar than, than just what we're gonna to address today. Um, if, you're, if you're literally specifying a house, um, you're gonna to need, to, to need to dive in a bit. But we'll, we'll cover the, the overarching themes here. So starting with ASHRAE 62.2, um, ASHRAE doesn't publish a code specifically. So they're not, um, you know, they get cited in codes is more likely what happens. ASHRAE um, are highly regarded in the industry. Um, they're referenced directly in the codes. ASHRAE 62.2 is the standard for ventilation and acceptable indoor air quality in residential buildings. Now there's a 62.1 as well, but that's for commercial buildings. So um, today we're talking about residential. Um, ASHRAE 62.2, so just some, some brief excerpts or highlights here. Um, it says that the ventilation system shall consist of one or more supply or exhaust fans and associated ducts and controls. So it could be supply only, could be exhaust only, could be balanced. Doesn't matter, but it's got to have you know those the, the, those the equipment and the controls for it and the ducting. Um, now it allows local exhaust fans to be credited towards the total required ventilation rate. I'm going to show you what this this uh, formula looks like in a second. 
Um, but, uh, but that, you know, as I pointed out before, local exhaust fans are typically allowed to be part of what's, what's uh, you know, contributing to the overall ventilation of the building. Also, under certain cir circumstances, ASHRAE 62.2 allows for infiltration to be credited towards the total required ventilation rate, just, you know, the natural leakiness of the building. But if you're going to do that, then a blower door test has to be performed in order to quantify that leakiness or to even determine if it's at a threshold that allows it. So here's the ventilation formula for ASHRAE 62.2. Uh, Q total equals 0 0.3 times the floor area plus 7.5 times the number of bedrooms plus one. So Q total is the total required ventilation rate and it's in CFM. Uh, a floor is a floor area. This is the dwelling unit floor area um, in square feet. And then NBR is the number of bedrooms. Um, it can't be less than one. So number of bedrooms plus one always has to be at least equal to two, right? So, um, so let's see what, what's being addressed here so far. So far what's being addressed in trying to arrive at a total ventilation rate via ASHRAE 62.2 is you have to take the building size into consideration because you have 0 0.03 times your square footage. And you also have to take the occupants into consider consideration because you have the number of bedrooms plus one. And number of bedrooms plus one is typically is the industry standard for sort of defining the occupancy of the house. So you're looking at the occupants and you're looking at the floor area or the size of the building. Um, now, this is the 2016 version of 62.2. I don't expect you to memorize this, but I just want to at least say it. Um, what changed in the 2016 version is that 0.03 times the square footage or the floor area. Um, in the previous version, which I believe was the 2010 version, um, and obviously the 2013 version stayed the same, but beginning 2010, it was 0 0.01 times the floor area. And that's significant. I'll show you why in a, in a minute. Um, but so in 2016, ASHRAE said, hey, we need to bump up the, uh, the standard ventilation rate for houses. So let's use that multiplier times the square footage. Let's make that three times as high. So they went from 0.01 to 0.03 times the square footage. All right. Now, that's, that's, that's to determine the overall ventilation rate for a house. Um, they also, ASHRAE 62.2 gives you this table. So if you don't want to, you know, if, you're, if your uh, algebra is sort of antiquated, then you can just flip over and use the table. And the table, um, it also takes into consideration both the floor area and the number of bedrooms. So uh, find your floor area down on the left-hand column, find the number of bedrooms across the top, and then, you know, figure out what your CFM is supposed to be. Then ASHRAE also, in addition to the total ventilation rate, addresses local exhaust. Again, local exhaust is de-stinkifying or dehumidifying, uh, particularly polluted areas like kitchens and baths. ASHRAE says in, in kitchens, if you're going to have demand controlled uh, ventilation, in other words, a hood that you turn on, um, that ventilation, that vent hood needs to be CFM, uh, 100 CFM, I'm sorry. If you have other kitchen exhaust fans not right over the range hood, then um, that has to be able to be turned on at 300 CFL. So that's intermittent or demand controlled. If you're gonna have it running 24 seven continuous, then the kitchen ventilation rate can be five ACH for the kitchen, not, not, the, not the house volume, but just the kitchen volume. And then you need to have local exhaust in the bathroom as well. Again, if you're intermittent or demand controlled, uh, you have to have a minimum of 50 CFM. Um, just as a side note, most bathroom exhaust fans that are rated at 50 CFM, by the time they get hooked up to a piece of flex duct that gets snaked around joists and run in a figure eight 
and deposited out of a soffit inside of a house, um, that's typically not going to give you 50 CFM. Just a side note. So, uh, but the, the, the requirement is 50 CFM. Um, however, if you, if you go to continuous 24 seven ventilation, um, then you can reduce that rate to 20 CFM, but that's running all the time. So these are the exhaust rates. Now, remember that ASHRAE says, once you figure out your exhaust rate, um, if your re overall required ventilation rate exceeds the exhaust rate that, or, or, or even if it doesn't, but the exhaust, the total exhaust rate required by these local exhausts can be applied towards your overall required ventilation rate that we figured out in the formula or using the table. Um, so let's just say you're doing an exhaust only system. You figure out your ventilation rate. Let's say it's just for round numbers. Let's say it's hundred CFM. Let's say you do uh, uh, let's say you do a, a, uh, a vented range hood at 100 CFM and a demand controlled bathroom at 50 CFM. Um, these are going to be running intermittently. So you can't really count that towards an overall uh, ventilation rate unless you commit to running those for a certain period of time during the day. And then you've got to, you've got to prorate that. So if it only runs 15 minutes out of every hour, you've got to you've got to multiply these numbers by 25% and then see if they offset your ventilation rate, your overall ventilation rate. If they don't, you either need to jack up your exhaust or you need to come in with a balanced supply system or something, but you've got to you've got to beef up to get to that 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 total required uh, ventilation rate. Um, so anyway, there's the overall rate and then there's the local exhaust. Local exhaust can apply to the overall rate um, in as much as it's uh, available. Now, if you go to continuous and you figure out what five ACH is for your kitchen, and let's just say that that comes out to be 50 CFM continuous out of a kitchen and you're doing 20 CFM continuous out of three bathrooms, well, now you're at 110 CFM total exhaust continuous. If your total requirement for the house is 100 CFM, now you've met that only by using your exhaust fans. And so if you want, you could be done with the ventilation. International Mechanical Code, let's move on and look at this. It's similar. Um, the IMC is, is, uh, is updated every three years. Um, it's typically what's adopted by local jurisdictions. Um, and they're usually, you know, at least one or two cycles behind. So right now, probably the 2021 has come out or I think it has come out. Um, but, you know, we won't see that. I, I live in New Hampshire. We won't see that. We just got to 2015. So we won't see 2021 till at least 2024, 2027. Um, but anyway, um, it gets updated and uh, it has a lot of details in it. Again, we're gonna look at the basics. The basic um, flow rate for, for figuring out the overall ventilation rate, the formula is very much the same as we just saw for ASHRAE. Notice that um, in the 2018 International Mechanical Code, they're still using the older ASHRAE formula. So they're still using 0 0.01 times the floor area, where ASHRAE 622 in 2016 went to 0 0.03. So again, you know, just an example of how you know ASHRAE typically sets the pace, and then the international code kind of follows, maybe a cycle or two behind that, and then local towns and states will adopt codes probably even another cycle or two behind that. So that's how, you know, the recognizing what's best practice um, and then just doing the code minimum, you're usually not coming close to best practice, but that's the nature of the beast. <clears throat> um, again, the IMC and kitchens, uh, they wanna see 100 CFM intermittent or 20 CFM, uh, 25 CFM continuous. So that's a little bit different than, the, than ASHRAE. 
Um, however, in bathrooms, um, the IMC is, is right on with ASHRAE, 50 CFM intermittent or 20 CFM continuous. And again, uh, continuous ventilation, um, the codes acknowledge that this is uh, much more effective. And so they, they let you get by with a much lower amount. We'll move on to the passive house standard, just as another example. Um, the passive house standard, this is a, uh, some of you may or may not be familiar, but it's a comprehensive building energy standard. Um, it's, not a, it's not a building code in terms of structure, but it is an energy standard that does look at the building envelope as well as the heating and cooling systems and, um, and everything about the insulation and the ventilation. Um, it uses a rigorous system of calculations. It basically has a, a very highly developed model that factors all these things into consideration to achieve an energy balance in the house that is below a, a specified level for the climate so that uh, you, know, you, can, you can meet a, a very stringent standard. Um, Passive House is not a binding code anywhere in North America right now. However, Passive House is recognized as a code path um, in different ways in different states. And it's also uh, being used as uh, a basis for awarding points in certain projects in certain parts of the country where, uh, where developers compete for state funding or whatever. So if they commit to building a project to the pass law standard, uh, they can get so many points on their proposal and get credited towards their overall score and try to win that proposal. There are two main passive house organizations in North America. Um, PHI is uh, Passive House International or Passive House Institute. That's sort of the international standard um, headquartered in Germany, started there in Germany. And then there's FIAS or Passive House Institute US, um, which is a, uh, a, a very separate uh, institute or organization um, and is uh, primarily US based, but does have some influence in other countries as well. Passive house principles, um, just real quickly, super insulated building envelope, uh, continuous air barrier, so they're minimizing air leakage. So you've got good thermal value, you've got good air control, so no leakage, no infiltration, exfiltration are very, very minimal. Um, high performance windows, so you're, you're eliminating the, the heat loss and heat gain through windows or minimizing it, I should say. And then you're minimizing thermal bridges around the, the building uh, points, you know, construction details where energy tends to leak in or out just through thermal bridges. And then the fifth point um, is the, the providing balanced ventilation that has energy recovery. So passive houses are usually achieving very high indoor air quality. On the ventilation side specifically, uh, here's the basics of passive house. Um, you need to, to, to supply a minimum of 18 CFM of outdoor air per person. And this is with the system on high speed. Uh, passive house requires different speeds in the ventilation system. Um, so there you are, you're addressing the, the, uh, you're addressing the number of occupants with your calculation of what your ventilation rate is going to be. Um, there's local exhaust ventilation requirements, just as there are with other codes. Um, in passive house, it's 12 CFM for laundry rooms and half baths. Uh, it's 24 CFM for full baths and 35 CFM for kitchens. These are all continuous rates. Passive house only ventilates on a continuous basis. Uh, and so you'll notice again, we have, we have, um, you know, so far we've, we've hit on the occupancy, we've hit on the local exhaust for the particularly polluted rooms. And then there's an overall air exchange rate in the building of 0 0.3 ACH. That's for the overall house. So basically 0 0.3 air changes per hour. So about an air change every three to four hours, a complete air change of the whole volume of the house. So we've addressed the size of the house we've addressed the number of occupants and we've addressed the local exhaust requirements. So again, very similar in, in that way 
to ASHRAE and to the International Mechanical Code. Um, the math is done a little bit differently, but again, the basic principles are being addressed. Um, it, my company, we do an awful lot of passive house projects around the country. And so again, very, it's very, very typical with these projects that by the time you, you tally up your exhaust, your local exhaust requirements, um, that total number is meeting the requirement for the other two combined. So it, it usually works out. All right, any question on, um, on some of those standards? Oh, before, before we have questions, let me, let me acknowledge, um, and I'm just gonna grab some notes here. I did, this didn't get into the presentation because it's more um, broadly prepared for North America, but um, in Vermont, you have the 2020 Residential Building Energy Standard, um, which does address ventilation requirements. So ventilation design is in R304.1 to 304.6. Ventilation controls are addressed in R304.7 and R304.8. Installation details are addressed in R304.9 to 304.11. And then you've got fan performance that's addressed down in 403.6. So, um, so your, your Vermont code, if, if you're designing and building in Vermont is pretty specific. Now, um, we'll note that the standard is very similar. In fact, in Vermont, what you can do from the design stand, standpoint is you can use either ASHRAE uh, 62.2, 2016, which we which we briefly covered here. Um, you can use the Building Science Corporation standard. Um, uh, I think it's 01 2015. I think is is the standard. But anyway, it's a ventilation standard uh, that Building Science Corporation came up with. Their standard uh, is base. I'm going to say very basically like the ASHRAE standard the old version, where it's that one third version, that, that 0.01 times your square footage. Um, and then uh, also uh, in Vermont, you can use the passive house standard as well as your design, uh, as your design stamp uh, basis. So, um, and then there's, there's both a prescriptive path and a performance path. So you can, you can basically size your equipment to meet the standards and then install that, or you can, um, you can design the whole system out with an engineering team, install it, and then commission it and, uh, and test and validate um, that you're meeting the ventilation rate. So, uh, so Vermont has its own standard, but again, it's very much in line with these other standards that were reviewed. So any questions on the standards? There you go, any questions? All right, no, rolling along. Wow, okay, we are rolling. This is actually working out better than I thought. And kudos for actually pulling out the specifics from the code. That's that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and, and again, it, very high level, but um, but the, the comforting thing is it's, you know, it's it's not like it's out of left field, something completely different. Uh, and it's in alignment with the IE, IECC, um, yeah. because of Vermont has pretty much adopted that with its own modification, so. Yep, yep exactly. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so we'll move on and describe the advantages of some advanced ventilation features. So all the standards that we talked about don't necessarily require these advanced ventilation features, but we're gonna talk now about some advanced ventilation features and, and talk about why, you know, why they're worth considering. Again, um, you know, code minimum is one thing but code minimum doesn't typically represent the current thought on best practices. So I'm gonna introduce some of that current thought. And we're gonna look at two features in particular. One is applying energy recovery to a balanced ventilation system. And the other thought is doing dedicated air distribution systems or dedicated duct work for your ventilation system. Um, so as we said before, you know, ventilating with open windows year round uh, or, or just relying on leakage isn't particularly effective because nobody wants that. 
at least in Vermont or New Hampshire. Um, and even if you do rely on natural ventilation or infiltration, um, or even if you ventilate uh, with a balanced mechanical system, but don't do any energy recovery, um, there is an energy penalty. Even if you do do energy recovery, I should say, regardless, there is always a an energy penalty with ventilating. In other words, you almost always have done some conditioning of the indoor air. And anytime you exchange outdoor air for indoor air, there's going to be an energy penalty associated with that because you're giving up some of the conditioning energy that you've invested in that indoor climate. So um, this may be heating season, it may be cooling season, um, but regardless, it's, it's, it's usually gonna have some cost. If this time of year, uh, we get a number of days where that's not the case. Uh, shoulder seasons can be nice, uh, but in a lot of parts of the country, even the shoulder seasons have a lot of humidity. And so they, they, they still have to work on conditioning that air. Um, so the energy penalty is real. And so always associated with ventilation. Um, we're not gonna get into this in a lot of detail. This is on the screen here. Um, this is not a, basically what I, what I wanna show you is that you can calculate in rough terms what the energy penalty is. You can figure out how many BTUs per hour um, it costs you to ventilate at a certain flow rate. And so uh, the BTUs per hour is, is roughly 1.08 times your, your ventilation rate in CFM multiplied by your delta T or your, your difference in temperature between outdoors and indoors uh, in Fahrenheit. So again, we're, we're not gonna do much with that. I don't expect you to memorize it. Just want you to know that there is a, a formula that you can use. This formula is rough. Um, it can be fine tuned to account for differences in air density and uh, moisture content, whatever. But this is a pretty good rule of thumb. So um, let's look at a cold climate example real quick. Let's just say it's, it's heating season. Outdoors for round numbers is 22 degrees Fahrenheit and the indoor thermostat is set to 50, uh, 72 Fahrenheit. So you have a Delta T of 50 degrees. So you run that through your equation. Let's say you have to do 100 CFM uh, to meet your ventilation requirements. Again, round numbers. So the ventilation uh, energy penalty is 5,400 BTUs per hour. 5.4 kBTUs per hour or, or 1.6 kilowatts. So that's that's significant. This is enough to, to, you know, somebody's doing a manual J and they take the ventilation into consideration. Um, this, this could be enough to change the size of the heating system. Um, maybe not much with your old school HVAC guys. They kind of oversize everything anyway, because why not? Um, and I say that tongue in cheek and you, hopefully you know why not <laughs> um, because of short cycling and things like that. But, um, but basically, you know, the energy, the point is the energy penalty of ventilation is significant um, if, if there's no mitigating measures taken. Um, hot climate example, let's say outdoors is 92. Again, indoors 72, we have a smaller Delta T now, uh, 20 degrees. Let's say it's the same 100 CFM ventilation rate. Now your, your uh, BTUs per hour uh, that your ventilation is gonna cost you just in the sensible heat at least is, is uh, over 2.1 kBTUs per hour or over 600 watts. So not as bad as in a cold climate, but it's still significant. Um, and it's, you know, it's gonna cost a lot of extra money to run that AC to do that cooling. Um, and then with the humidity, you know, because 20% of our, of our country uh, in the US, at least 20% is living with humidity most of the year. And a lot of the rest of us are living with humidity during a good chunk of the year. Um, you know, in a, in a hot, humid climate, 
um, that ventilation rate might cost somebody uh, 200 pints per day of moisture. That's a good size dehumidifier. So this is the energy penalty of ventilation. And so if we can do some energy recovery on the ventilation, um, that's a really smart thing to do. We want the comfort of ventilation all year round. Um, or we want, we want the, the benefit of ventilation all year round, but we don't want it to be uncomfortable and we don't want it to cost us a fortune in operating costs. So energy recovery ventilation is the way to go. Energy recovery ventilation, basically, it's, it's employed on a balanced mechanical ventilation system where you have both supply and exhaust fans. You are both pulling outdoor air in and pushing uh, indoor air out. And energy recovery is being accomplished between those two air streams. So again, we'll start in a cold climate, uh, heating season in winter. The indoor air is warmer. And so uh, as you run your exhaust air and your supply air through the same appliance, an ERV um, or an HRV, uh, you're going to extract um, air. I mean, you're going to extract heat from your exhaust air and deliver that to the incoming supply air. So you're, you're, you're transferring energy. This is, uh, we'll see briefly in a moment that this is done passively, not actively, typically. Um, but nonetheless, you're recovering energy from the indoor air before you pump it outside as exhaust air. In the summer, uh, you're recovering, or uh, there's a couple of ways to talk about recovery sounds wrong because you're not trying to recover heat. You're trying to transfer heat before you bring in supply air. So you're transferring heat from the supply air coming in from outside over to the exhaust air and exhausting that excess heat with your exhaust air. Uh, some people call this cold recovery. Um, it's inaccurate because cold isn't a thing, heat is a thing. But, um, but uh, in any case, the, 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 the physics of it are the same. Uh, air is moving by conduction across the medium inside of this, this appliance and it's moving between the two airstreams. Um, there are a lot, there, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are a few different types of energy recovery technologies. The most common used in North American homes is fixed plate uh, recovery ventilation systems. These fixed plates are stacked one on top of each other to basically form sort of a, a, a heat exchanger, almost a radiator in a way. And, and both outdoor supply air and indoor exhaust air are passed through this heat exchanger uh, the two airstreams are kept separate using uh, just using the, the geometry and, uh, and flow management inside the appliance. So the two airstreams never actually mix, but they are split up into very fine airstreams and uh, passed by each other on opposite sides of these thin plates. And through these thin plates, you have the conduction of heat. And in some cases, um, also the migration of moisture, but you keep air quality contaminants um, from, it, from one airstream out of the other airstream. So you're able to keep the airstreams from being contaminated, um, but recover the energy using this device. So uh, here you can see a, a cutaway of part of the cross section of one of these heat exchangers and you see these channels that are formed and these channels are what's conducting air through there. And that's, that's, that's where you're able to keep the outdoor air and the indoor air separate from each other, but, uh, but recover energy. Um, depending on the size and shape of the heat exchanger, um, you can kind of, you can, you can maximize how much energy you're, you're recovering. Uh, we're going to do another session later this month where we talk about performance in these devices and what impacts performance. But uh, so for now, I'll just leave it at that. So the, typically what's hap what happens is this heat exchanger is combined into a cabinet where you have controls. You also have two fans 
supply fan and your exhaust fan, and then just a, a system of ducts or plenums to organize all that. And then you can connect that to, to uh, the distribution system in the house and connect to uh, outdoor uh, grills for exhaust and intake. All this can be done into a relatively compact appliance. Um, so there's two air streams, but because you're connecting to both the outside of the house and the inside of the house, these appliances always have at least four duct connections. So you can think of two, one set of duct connections is air flowing in one direction. The other set of duct connections is air flowing in the other direction, uh, both flowing through the appliance. So you label your four duct connections, one as outdoor air or ODA, and this is carrying uh, unconditioned fresh air from outside directly to the heat exchanger. And then that continues on after it passes through the heat exchanger, that, that airstream continues on, but now it comes out of the duct connector labeled supply air or SUP, SUP. And so from this duct connection, we're dealing with the same airstream, the outdoor airstream, but now it's been tempered in the heat exchanger, it's been filtered, and now it's gonna be delivering fresh air from the heat exchanger to the rooms in the house. Then in this case, on this diagram, on the bottom uh, of the diagram, we have the other airstream. This is the airstream that's taking air from inside the house. We call this extract air, ETA. And it's pulling air from inside the house, running it through the heat exchanger. Um, and then after it goes through the heat exchanger and exchanges energy with the outdoor airstream, it continues through the, uh, the fourth duct connection, which is the exhaust air connection or EHA, and is delivered from there directly to the outdoor grill where it's exhausted to the outside. So the important thing is just, you know, two air streams, but four duct connections. Occasionally, uh, there might be a fifth duct connection or something else. Uh, some manufacturers do a uh, like a recirculation mode for defrost or uh, something like that where they might incorporate a fifth duct connection. Um, we're not going to talk about that today, but mi at minimum, an HRV or ERV always has these four duct connections. Okay, so let's talk about whole house ventilation systems. Um, Basically, what we just covered was, you know, sort of one advanced feature is actually incorporating energy recovery. Um, by the way, um, those, you know, the, the BTUs that we talked about being lost if you don't do energy recovery. A good, a good energy recovery system can recover, let's say, 80, maybe even 90 percent in some cases of that lost energy. So, um, so that's a big deal. That's a that's a that's a worthwhile investment for something that's you know going to be running for the next dozens of years. Um, so there we talked about energy recovery as one advanced feature, not required by the code, but uh, obviously has great value. Now we'll move on and we'll talk about what we do with this air once we have fresh air, and maybe we've recovered energy, so the fresh air is going to be comfortable. Now, what do we do with it? Um, how do we get it around the house? And it's common in North America um, to take the fresh air from the HRV or ERV, or even if it's not an HRV or ERV, um, it's very common to take fresh air from outdoors and just dump it in to the air handler that is being used for heating and cooling. Now, of course, not every house uses a forced air heating system. Some use hydronic systems, but if there is a, a heating or cooling system that use forced air, um, it's very typical if there's an HRV or ERV involved to simply dump that air into the into the air handling system and be done with it. Um, both of these systems have blowers. Both of them have ducts. Both of these systems move air around, so that seems sort of like a natural thought. Um, but 
we want to point out that forced air heating and cooling systems actually have pretty different functions from whole house ventilation systems. Different functions, therefore different features. And, um, and this should cause us to, to pause for a moment and think about what we do with these systems. So just a little, little chart here. What's the function of a forced air heating and cooling system? Well, that's to maintain a constant temperature, a comfortable temperature range within the building. That's one function. The whole house ventilation system isn't worried primarily about maintaining the temperature of the building. It's worried about maintaining good air quality. Those are, those are kind of two different things. Air quality meaning reducing the contaminants and keeping the air quality comfortable and healthy for the occupants. Um, because of those different functions, the required flow rate is very different. So it's very typical in a common house uh, with a heating or cooling system to have a system for heating and cooling that's over a thousand CFM when it operates. But by contrast, a whole house ventilation system only needs maybe, again, not a fixed number, it varies depending on the house, but typically in the range of 100 CFM or something like that. So many orders of magnitude difference between these two. Therefore, their ideal duct sizes are also quite different. Um, in general, your heating and cooling system requires big ducts, maybe 10 or 12 inch ducts, something like that, maybe even bigger. Your whole house ventilation system, by comparison, requires very small ducts. Um, the controls are different. Controls for the heating and cooling system, of course, are temperature based, whereas the controls for a whole house ventilation system would be occupancy based or might be uh, contaminant based, you know, air quality based, sensor based. The runtime um, for a forced air heating system is going to be intermittent, depending on, on how the temperature is being maintained, whereas the runtime in a whole house ventilation system, ideally, if you're doing a, a best practices, then you're doing one that's gonna run continuously during occupancy. So again, there's a mismatch between the runtime. Um, for heating and cooling, what are the supply rooms? Well, the supply rooms are basically all the habitable spaces. You wanna maintain the temperature in all those spaces. Um, in a whole house ventilation system, for reasons that we'll see, uh, Supply rooms are, are primarily bedrooms and maybe living rooms or offices. Again, return rooms, best practices, as I understand it, for heating and cooling is to supply and return from every room. But in a whole house ventilation system, you don't need to supply and return in every room. You supply in certain rooms and then you return from other rooms. And so you create a, a, a circuit through the house. Um, what about recirculation of air? Almost always, I mean, uh, with COVID, we, we did begin to consider uh, systems that don't recirculate air for heating and cooling. But even now, um, the answer, even with COVID, is typically to add filtration. But you're almost always recirculating the same air as you heat and cool the air. Whereas with whole house ventilation, um, you want to almost never recirculate indoor air. Um, in fact, the uh, IMC doesn't let you do that. It restricts that recirculated air, recirculated air to a very small amount. So you can see there's so many distinctions that really there's, there's more differences between heating and cooling systems and ventilation systems than there are in common. In common, they have fans, they have ducts, they move air around. That's about it. So we should be thoughtful and recognize these differences. Um, these distinguishing features drive a lot of functional and physical differences. And so in short, what we wanna do ideally is dedicate an air distribution system for whole house ventilation that is fit to its purpose. Um, now, let's acknowledge that again, in North America, this is not done. So typically what is done in North America is that your supply air and your ex extract air, or people often call that return air, your supply and return air ducts from the ERB are connected right to the heating and cooling system. 
So we'll acknowledge that that's the reality. And let's talk about how that's typically done. There's a few different ways. Quick glance at the time because we're going fast here. Um, so one way is by return integration. Now here, you see in this diagram, some features that we're gonna see in this subsequent diagrams that are gonna be very common. We have the furnace or the air handler. We have a supply duct or supply plenum, I should say, and return plenum in the air handler. Then we have an ERV. It has two ducts connecting to the outside for exhaust and intake, but then its other two ducts are connecting to the house in some fashion. Um, and we're gonna show how they can be connected to the air handler system. On a return air integration with supply air only, the supply air from the ERV is ducted directly to the return plenum on the furnace and it gets distributed to the house using the air handler system for heating and cooling. The return air for the ERV in this case, let's say, is going to come from its own dedicated ducts from the bathrooms and kitchen. Now, disadvantages of this system. With the air handler running, uh, the supplier is going to be mixed with the heating and cooling, and it's going to be supplied basically to every room. It's not going to be targeted to specific rooms. Maybe that's not so bad, but we'll see in, some, in, in, in a few slides why we'd prefer to target special rooms. With the air handler not running, what's going to happen in this scenario is that the relatively low volume of supply air from the ERV is going to go into the air handling system. It might just pop out of the nearest return duct, uh, return grill, or even if, it, if there's a backflow damper and it goes through the supply duct, it's still going to come out a pretty big size duct and it's just going to pour out of a pretty, pretty good sized grill in the first one or two grills that it finds. Usually it's not going to make its way through the whole supply air system because the ERV just doesn't deliver enough air to pressurize that large duct system. So the performance is going to be unpredictable and not targeted. Now we have supply integration, where basically your supply from the ERV is uh, ducted directly into the supply plenum, not the return plenum as we saw here, but to the supply plenum. Um, and again, still in this case, the return air uh, for the ERV has its own uh, dedicated duct work. So uh, what are the disadvantages here? Well, uh, again, we're not gonna be particularly targeted. We're gonna be distributing the ventilation air to the whole house. Um, if we're in a hot, humid climate, it could be a, a concern. Depending on the performance of the ERV, you could end up with some humidity still in the supply air from the ERV, and that could be hitting very cold ductwork inside the supply air um, after you go through the AC coil. So you could have some added condensation inside the supply, um, the supply uh, ductwork for the air handler. With the air handler not running, um, we're back into the same scenario we just said before, where you basically have a little bit of air trickling into a big duct system and it's just gonna be uh, unpredictable performance, um, unpredictable uh, air distribution. Now, uh, this is a return supply integration where uh, you're, you're connecting both ducts from the ERV to the air handler uh, system. So you, again, the supply air is to the supply air duct and the return air is to the return air duct. Um, these are just, just a variation on a theme um, but again, same concerns with, with air distribution. Um, and here, a couple of concerns on the return side from the ERV, a little bit different. Um, and that is that you could just get a loop effect where you're, you're short cycle, short circuiting, and uh, your return air and supply air, basically when the air handler for the furnace is not operating and you don't have a backdraft damper, you could just be pulling air through the furnace, supply air from your ERV and returning it um, in reverse through the furnace to your ERV. So you're really not distributing air at all in some cases. Um, so that's just one of the added disadvantages 
in addition to the other disadvantages that we highlighted before. And then again, uh, another variation on a theme where both the supply and the return from the ERB are ducted to the return duct uh, from the air handler. And again, the disadvantages are, are again, very much like we, like we saw before. So um, integrated controls are another topic. Um, you basically, if, if you're gonna try to come over or, or, or uh, try to address some of the disadvantages of these other system integration approaches, one of the ways you're gonna do that is with uh, control integration where you at least, at least have the air handler running whenever the ERV is running. If the ERV is running intermittently, ideally the ERV runs continuous and so then you have to run the furnace continuously, or at least the air handler continuously. So now you're into integration of controls potentially. Um, integrating the ductwork isn't ideal, but it does have advantages. This slide is basically just acknowledging that if you try to integrate the ductwork, yes, you're going to save space, uh, the space of additional ductwork. Yes, you're going to save labor in, for the installers integrating. Um, materials and labor should save money. Um, and yeah, you can meet the minimum code requirement this way. And so for, for a lot of people, these advantages of, of basically money savings um, outweigh the disadvantages in performance and the disadvantages in, in indoor air quality. But let's look at the advantages of a standalone system. Uh, again, we'll do this very quickly. First of all, we have a targeted air distribution, air distribution system where we put the supply air exactly where we want it. We have operational simplicity because we're not trying to uh, integrate controls with the air handler from the heating cooling system. And we can right size our equipment, right size our duct work. Um, this is basically just talking about not compromising, you know, do, going, going for best practices in order to get the best results. Uh, local exhaust is always required. So why not make your local exhaust the places where you take extract air for your ERV for your balanced, uh, a balanced mechanical ventilation system with energy recovery. Um, bathrooms uh, and kitchens are great places to do extract air. So let's have a targeted air distribu distribution system that takes the, the extract air for the ERV from these spaces. And now we've met the code requirement for local exhaust and, um, and we're improving into air quality and we're doing it with energy recovery. Um, we should prioritize bedrooms for supply air. Uh, I can't get in, don't have time to get into the details of this study, but Brian Just from Efficiency Vermont did this study. Some of you may have seen it. I, I reference this study all the time. Um, 22 Vermont homes with all different types of heating uh, systems in the middle of winter and Brian monitored the CO2 in uh, these, these 22 homes over the course of four nights, alternating nights with the bedroom, master bedroom door closed or open. And you can see the CO2 levels uh, during these nights. Always at night in excess of, or I shouldn't say always, but most homes were in excess of the 1000 PPM CO2 level that is recommended by ASHRAE. In some cases, with the bedroom doors closed, frighteningly high levels of CO2. Um, and the bottom graph isolates three of the houses that had a balanced mechanical ventilation system that targeted bedrooms, including the, the master bedroom, with supply air. And you can see that on those, um, very successfully kept the, uh, the, the master bedroom uh, at or below the 1000 ppm suggested limit for CO2. So, so targeting our supply air specifically to the bedrooms pays big dividends in places where people are expending extended hours. Um, so, and I'm just on this slide, just referencing, uh, this will be available for you to look at later, but there was a study done um, in Denmark where CO2 levels were monitored at nighttime and then cognitive performance 
was studied on the following day and it impacts cognitive performance um, the day after when you sleep in a high versus low CO2 space. So 2021 International Mechanical Code has not yet come out uh, in most states, um, it hasn't been adopted in most states, but in the 2021 IMC, they did credit, they recognized this, this value of targeting bedrooms. And so they said, if you specifically target bedrooms with your supply air uh, ventilation, then you can reduce your overall ventilation rate by 30%. So they're basically saying, if you do the best practice, then we're gonna reward you by saying you don't need to invest as much in your overall ventilation system. So um, just some recognition there that targeted ventilation systems uh, are valuable. Um, again, uh, the Building Science Corporation standard that, uh, that your Vermont standard uh, recognizes also has a, uh, I think it's a 25% credit um, if you do if you do a, a, a what call it a targeted distribution system, um, but basically if you're if you're balanced and, and targeted, so um, a lot of different people are recognizing that that this is worthwhile. Operational simplicity: if you've got a, a you know, you can hit the boost system uh, in the bathroom. And you know you can't really do that as as readily if you're trying to do an integrated system. So there's just some operational features that are more valuable when you do a standalone ventilation system. So basically, we're looking at right sizing the system. Um, you know, don't don't bring a crane when a wheelbarrow will do the trick. So don't don't try to involve the whole house heating and cooling system when a smaller uh, standalone ventilation system will do the trick. It'll be quieter. It'll be more comfortable. There'll be minimum drafts. Um, there'll be better air quality overall in places that matter. And, uh, and you'll be better prepared to commission the system for all operating conditions. So uh, I think that's all I've got today. Thanks for hanging through there. Uh, we went the full 90 minutes plus and um, uh, reach out to us at zenderamerica.com if you have any other questions, if we can follow up. I'm willing to hang on here um, if anybody else doesn't mind, if there are some questions or discussion points. Great. Thank you very much, Chris. This has been great. Great content. Well done. Well laid out. Uh, thank you to you guys who joined us here today. Uh, Chris will be doing a follow-up session which goes into some more specifics about design operations here as well but um, any other questions um, feel free to ask me now Michael saying thanks that was great learned a lot you're welcome Appreciate that Michael yeah it looks like Alex has a question Alex you can unmute. Yeah. Hey, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. So uh, I am curious. We um, thank you, Chris. Appreciate yeah, it. Everyone. We often will have uh, uh, zenders in our house, and it's wonderful. And um, I'm curious. I, I often feel like the 350 is more than we need, and you know, like your your lower CFM units, which are also lower cost, which is really the driver. You know, I see that. You know, I, th I think at 350, I just pulled it up on the line here. It looks like 218 CFM that it's supplying. So like, is there, is, is that, a, is that a, uh, a threshold that I can push up against, uh, you know? It's, yeah, so that, so the way, that, yeah, it's a product specific question. Um, our, usually when we talk, we'll, we'll say these are our max um, speeds and 218 CFM for the 350 is usually the max speed on a pretty typical air distribution system. Of course, once you get your ductwork attached, you see how crazy that ductwork can be. Sometimes that influences your overall flow rate. But um, just as an example, that Comfort 350 that you're asking about, 218 is the max speed. 
we usually will design the system with a, with a ComfortWare 350 to run at about half of that speed. So usually you're looking at somewhere in 100, 120 CFM range is the normal operating speed. From there, they can even go into low speed or they can go into a way mode. So if, if you know, the, most of the ventilation codes only require these ventilation rates when the building is occupied. So you could theoretically turn the system off when it's not occupied and still be meeting code. Uh, we have a way mode, which is just a very slight trickle of air through the system. Um, low speed is somewhere in between there and the normal speed, which again, for the 350 is maybe around 100, 120 CFM. And then that extra, you know, up to 200 or 218 or whatever, typically will be reserve, reserved for boost mode. Um, now you ask, how much can you, you know, can you press up against that limit? And the answer is, you can, you could, you could operate all the time up to 218 CFM. Um, the, the problem with that is this, the, the, the unit is engineered around a kind of a sweet spot or a, or a range, I should say, not a spot, but a range. Um, and that 100 to 120 CFM range is where you're gonna get optimal fan performance. In other words, your, your um, you know, watts per CFM or CFM per watts, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, but your, your efficiency of your fan operation. And not only that, but the efficiency of the energy recovery out of the heat exchanger. So that heat exchanger is basically operating on the principle of surface area. You know, you've, you're, you're pushing so much air across certain surface area within the heat exchanger. And that tells you how much heat can conduct across that surface um, into the opposing airstream. So at, at a, in a sweet spot, you know, you, you, you engineer the system so that the, there's enough layers and enough surface area in that heat exchanger, in this case, to where 100 to 120 CFM ought to give you somewhere around 80 or 90 percent, depending on whether you're in HRV or an ERV, um, et cetera. But you jack that up to 200 CFM, and now you're pushing the air through much faster but you're not providing any more surface area in the heat exchanger. So your heat recovery efficiency of 80 to 90% is gonna drop down to maybe, you know, it might be 50 or 60% or something like that. So that's, that's where you kind of wanna, you know, understand the specs and understand, yes, we can get this air out of it in boost mode, but, but there's a sweet spot for it to run at. So long, long answer to a simple question, but, uh, that that I think should answer it. Yeah, it does. Yes, that's good. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I, I wasn't really thinking about the volume of air running through that, not to mention when it might be 15 below zero. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. All right. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to wrap up. Um, Chris, thanks again. This was great. And uh, we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you for uh, those of you who attended. And hopefully we'll see you again in a couple of weeks as well. So take care. All right. Bye-bye. Yep.